Quiet on set, you damn kids. Who wants to make a short? We'll pay you an IMDb credits and experience. Lights, camera, action, it's I don't give a flick. Your favorite film podcast, oh yeah. Tarantino, Mero, and Spielberg, here's looking at you, kid. We talk movies and TV shows and sometimes other things we like. And no one's coming right at your fucking face. Every minute of every day will never stop. We'll talk lenses, music, and foley. We'll understand the depth of field. We've got theories so out of this world and epic it'll blow off your fucking tits. Oh yeah, that was bullshit. Hey, all you cool cats and kittens out there in fucking fuck me land, welcome to our podcast where we talk about M. Night Shyamala. That's going to be an awful, awful intro. Can that be our intro this week? A Night of Regrets brought to you by Gary Elmore. Look, okay, look, listen, I'm going to admit listen. to you right now, all I right, may have had like listening. seven screwdrivers before this show. Oh my god, oh, that's fucking classic. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of I Don't Give a Flick. Uh, I'm your host, Johnny Blackburn. Alongside me this week, as they are every week, are... Gary Elmore. And, and the sober Neil Riley. Oh, yeah, you got to point that out, do you, Neil? Okay, I see how it is. Or, or I see how it is, Neil. You fucking, I love you so much. You're like, you're like my goddamn brother. Uh, uh, yeah, we're all sober except Gary, so this is going to be a lot of fun. Super excited. We are welcoming back to like the show. Why are you going to call me out? Because it's fun. You just got through telling everybody how you're drinking, uh, drinking yourself through your depression. So okay. we all want to be involved with it, with you and, you know. Want to just have a good old time, just a grand just old laughing. time, grand old time at the grand old podcast. If, uh, we, jo- don't, if we don't tell them you're drinking, <laughs> they'll think you're having a stroke. Joining us this week, as you could just hear, is uh, the guy that brings the pain every week. It's Michael Payne. Michael, welcome back. Thank you. It's always fun. Uh, Indeed. This week we are actually uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, jump on a topic that you guys have actually uh, uh, requested a couple times in the past that we just forgot about. And Michael uh, did bring it up to us the other week. And so we thought we'd go on ahead and celebrate everybody's something or other director. There's a lot of mixed feelings on him and we'll get into those mixed feelings uh, as well as your own personal feelings if you call in. Uh, But if you're not going to, then you can listen to our rants on the rise and fall of M. Night Shyamalan, America's sweetheart. But he's not even American. Pretty sh... Yeah, no, I guess he was born in India and then came over. Yeah, he was born in... That was what he said? He was born in Pondicherry. Okay, okay. Um, Uh, Good old Pondicherry sweetheart. Who is this Gandhi? (laughs) Stop, Gary. (laughs) Who is this Gandhi? (laughs) What? (laughs) Gary, I don't understand the reference you're making. I don't know. I don't. I don't it's know. It's a Kingsley that. movie. It won an Academy Award. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, one thing we can all agree on with M Night Shyamalan is he certainly started out strong, like uh, a few other directors and uh, actors that we'll probably go over on our list tonight that we normally do, and. We'll get into it. We'll talk about where he uh, where he fell from grace and how he has attempted to make a huge comeback over the last couple of years. Uh, so I'm, I'm interested to see from our panel who's actually seen a lot of the films that he's talked about, excuse me, that he's actually filmed uh, over the last five, six years. I think that we all just I don't know about you guys, but every time he came out with a movie after Six Sense, every time I saw the trailer, I was honestly for about. 2099 2000s when six cents came out so i would say probably for you know a good decade i was still excited for a lot of his films when i saw the trailers i bet you, know? you i could guess what film made you not excited oh kenya Lady in i want the water. you well that is <laughs> one of them that is one of them and thank god for as Gary said, thank God for alcohol because that was right at the height of my 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 drinking prowess. Did I did and, I say uh, that? I don't remember saying that. What? Thank God for alcohol. Hey Gary, go have a screwdriver. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. <laughs> have one more, Gary. Gary, have yourself a car bomb. 
let's 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 jump in here out outside of Shyamalan. We, we will obviously get to him. So off the top of our heads, are there any big Hollywood stars, directors, uh, screenwriters, producers that Hollywood still sticks on a movie poster or sticks on the trailer saying a film by or starring blah, 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 that they're using as that. A-list type to try to get you to come and see the movie. They're trying to coerce us into actually sitting through, you know, two hours of this. Um, and that star they're using does not do it for you. Like you're you're like, I've seen enough of their crap. I'm not gonna go see any more movies just because their name is on the is on the trailer or is on the title poster. Um, so let's jump into that. Uh Gary, I'm interested to hear yours. On this one, uh, is there anybody that you just don't give a crap about anymore and you're tired of seeing Hollywood put that person's name on posters outside of Shyamalan? Ryan Johnson is uh, probably the one that comes to mind for that. Uh, okay. he, di he directed a movie called Knives Out after he did The Last Jedi. And uh, I, I think Michael okay. is probably uh, in the same boat with that and probably Neil, uh, okay. where we were like, you know what? I'm not going to see that movie just because... Ryan Johnson directed it, even though it looked like an intriguing movie. It was a good film. Not going to lie. He, he hit it out of the park. But, uh, you know, different, different, you know, sci-fi and and murder mystery, you know, obviously two very conflicting or different, at least, genres. He uh, subverted for sure. your okay. expectations. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what to expect going in. Uh, I, th I thought it was pleasant. But I can understand, especially for those of you that may have listened to, or if you haven't, go check it out, our Star Wars Universe episode. Uh, yeah, uh, most of our panel definitely panned the uh <laughs> the uh last jedi and the most three recent films uh anyways so neil what about you is there any uh, hollywood a-lister of the producer director acting type uh that you just don't want to go see their films because you're tired of the you're tired of the crap they're putting out or they're just overrated i i when she first came out i really liked uh jennifer lawrence i thought she did a good job in the first couple of films but then i just felt mm -hmm. like they, she just got crammed down my throat and i felt like nothing ever changes between her movies so anything uh -huh. she's in i just avoid at this point okay yeah i i can totally see that i don't even know i think i, I saw her in uh dallas buyers club like seven years ago that one that mcconaughey and jared leto won for and it was a really good film i just i don't know if i've seen her in anything since then I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, Neil. I'm, I'm sorry. Did you say Jennifer Lawrence or Jennifer Garner? Jennifer Lawrence. I'm sorry. OK. All right. So different. Jennifer Garner was Dallas Fire stuff. Yeah. Jennifer Lawrence is in a lot of stuff. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. She did that one with uh, Chris Pine, um, the, the sci fi one where they're on the space station together. Uh, Chris Pratt. I'm sorry. Uh, it was I don't even remember the name of the movie. Anyways, yeah, it, it was Passengers. That's right. Uh, and that one was just god awful and that just yeah I, I can i can see that that certainly gave me a, a a bit of a bad taste in my mouth from her uh you know just all of her early work with um silver linings playbook and uh american hustle anything with that she had with david or russell going on uh was was getting a lot of credit anyways uh michael what about you who pops into your mind not that i have anything against the actor like i think he does a perfectly fine job in the roles that he's in it's just i think seen too much of him over the past mm -hmm couple of years is a Dwayne the Rock Johnson like it seems okay. like every time you turn around he's in another film and it's like I said he doesn't do bad jobs it's just I like to see somebody different every once in a while I mean he was like the highest paid actor for yep. like several five years. or six years yeah, yeah. Yep. he not, and everybody's not... favorite Vin Diesel who's also yep. in those Fast and Furious films Gary he is so, that you love so dearly it's about not, not family the... Not the wealthy. He may he was highly successful, made a crap ton of money. Not the wealthiest WWE member, though. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh if I if I remember correctly, I think it's one. What's his name? Donald Trump. Trump. <laughs> I don't know if that was because of WWE, but you know, hey, good, good, hey, good times all he's around. In, he's in the Hall of Fame, so <laughs> he is that technically is, in. The isn't Hall of Fame. isn't Dennis Rodman also? I, last time I checked, I think probably For like there's celeb celebrity, I guess celebrity appearances yep. and such. And you know what? And they've both been to North Korea. So what does that yeah, tell you? Yeah, North Korea is a happening place, ladies. Go and to North America. Korea, get rich. Got it. Yep. yep. Yeah. Okay. Check mark. Yep. Check mark. We've we've got it down. Uh, I'd have to say I mine has actually been the same one probably for the last decade. I would say Tim Burton. Uh, I I can't 
they still try to push movies out with his name attached. And honestly, I, I just I can't do it anymore. I really can't. You know, I mean, ever since Charlie and the Chocolate Factory came out in 2005, um, I thought Alice in Wonderland was really weak. Uh, I didn't actually see Corpse Bride, but I hear a lot of people telling me that was pretty good. I, I was a huge fan of Sweeney Todd, like the musical. And then seeing the movie, uh, I, I know his I know his twist and I, I know how he really likes to. He has a certain tone about him and he he always tries to stick to his style of directing and that's great that he doesn't forget where he came from and how he started his his ride but at the same time i'm just just like you're talking about with dwayne the rock johnson i'm just i'm just tired of seeing it i'm tired of seeing the same thing over and over again i'd like to see uh um i'd like to see a new director come out that kind of controls the platform of the mixture between whimsical horror and fantasy you know, I, mean, I know that was I think you're right. for a long time. I think he should have gone out on a high after Mars Attack. So <laughs> <laughs> that was a great movie. Yeah, it was. It was. It was. It was. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Um, you know, and yeah, the other guy he he had between between that the Batman's and Beetlejuice and Sleepy Hollow. He had he had some good ones back in the day, but they're, um, they are oh. doing another Beetlejuice. Is it directed by Tim Burton? I believe it is. Oh. I think he's producing. I don't know if he's directing. Ding. Oh my fucking Satan. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> Who yeah. would be directing it instead? Yeah, right over there? I get yeah, I think he is directing it actually. Yeah, okay. Um yeah, I mean that I I God, I don't know if I I don't know if I would go see a remake of it. Like I don't know if you guys saw it's not a remake. Oh, it's not it, a remake, it's a it's one? a continuation of the story. Oh, for God's sake. OK, same same thing, guys. If you haven't listened to it, go back to season uh, beginning of season one where we talk about how Hollywood just keeps recycling screenplays. And it's just it's just getting old. It's getting old. Come up with some new ideas, guys. There's lots of stories to tell across the world or make up. Figure something out. I do like when uh, a writer in that. I mean, when she's like sitting there writing her suicide note and she's like, <laughs> by the time you read this, I will have jumped <laughs> off the the winter, the winter river, river bridge. <laughs> it's great. Is that your favorite? Is that your favorite part of the movie, Gary? Uh, I don't know. I I think my favorite part of Beetlejuice would probably be when they're uh, all singing um, uh, during the dinner scene. Would be mine. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, well, I on on that note, let's move from one overrated director to another. Uh, let's jump into Shyamalan, uh, just to, I'm sure most of you are familiar with his work, but, uh, yeah, just a gentleman who was, who was born in India, came over to the States with his, uh, parents who were both physicians, uh, was, went to, uh, some, uh, Catholic grammar school, um, and lived in Philly for most of his life. And, uh, apparently started off in 98 with a film called Wide Awake, uh, Michael, Care to tell us a tiny bit about that film? Because you seem to know more about it than any of us. Oh, Wide Awake. That was the uh, the Rosie O'Donnell is a nun and she's helping the kid out. I haven't seen that movie in a very long time. I think that was towards the end of uh, Rosie O'Donnell's career in movies. Mm -hmm. um, I think she, I'm trying to remember if I really even remember much about that film but no all i remember is that she was in it and she was a nun and she was helping this kid and baseball had something to do with it like he was really into it and that's how they made this connection but okay. yeah you could tell that she was by that point it was more about how rosie o'donnell was ending her career than it was about m night Shyamalan picking it up it start beginning his at, at the at the onset well that one certainly uh, at least from the list that we have is really his his only major financial failure um we'll get to lady in the water at some point down the line here but at least that one came close to breaking even uh i mean that one had a budget of six million box office claim that they only made about three hundred thousand. so the fact that he was able to get funding for his next film and i would assume the general consensus across the board is his best one um was was just a little surprising to me but before we get into the movies themselves um i had been reading a lot of articles on him uh, over the last hour or so before we started and a lot of critics had started to claim him over the first couple of years from about 99 to 2003 i guess 2004 they started claiming him as the next up and coming of spielberg that is 
Ha ha. Womp womp womp. I subverted your expectations. Psych, pull the rug out from under me. Uh, what the hell do you guys? So let's let's take it like this. If these are the first couple of years that he's been making movies, the three films that would fall into that era would be Six Sense, Unbreakable, and Signs. Based off those three movies, let's 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 pretend we're back in 2002 and we've just all seen signs. We're all in junior high or early high school, whatever. And what are we thinking? These these comments and predictions that he's going to be the next big all time great Hollywood director up on the level of Scorsese, Spielberg, Tarantino and so forth. Is that an overreaction from the first big three films that we had seen from him? Uh, Michael, what do you think? Overreaction, uh, underreaction. Given the box office take that he took from the first three films, I would say that people, looking back, it was an overreaction, obviously. Sure. But in the moment, I could see. It's always hard when you're like, "Oh, this is the next Hitchcock, or the next Spielberg, or the next this, or the next that," because I think you're setting people up for failure because mm-hmm. they'll never, you know, everyone is different, and they'll always have. Uh, if I was a big time Hollywood director, I would rather people know me as, hey, this is Michael Payne, the Hollywood director, than, hey, this is Michael Payne, the next Spielberg. Right. Because it's more about my name than it is about the other dudes. But back in the day, um, it's slightly embarrassing. So, Signs, <laughs> um, it's actually the film that I've seen the most times in the movie theater <laughs> as a <laughs> single film. Overall, just in general. Overall, like the most really? times I've gone to a movie theater to okay. see a specific film, I went to see Signs 11 times. Oh, my the God. Wow. God. Oh, my God. So of that 408 million that are brought in, you oh, spent... I'm good at that. <laughs> you chipped um, in a third of it, gotcha. No. <laughs> yep. Like, I don't know what it was. I was I was in high school, so I was stupid. But um, I really liked the movie. I really yeah. liked the soundtrack. I really liked a lot of stuff about that movie. I didn't see it for like a good eight to 10 years and tried to rewatch it and was like, what the hell did I do? But yeah, I mean, at the time, I could see why people were saying, oh, we can't wait to see what his next movie is going to be. This is great. This is neat. He's doing cool stuff. He's doing interesting things. So I could I could understand it, but I think it's I think it's a little overboard. Sure, sure. Uh, Neil, how about you? When Six Sense came out, obviously everyone was blown away by his plot twist because, you know, that guy in the hairpiece, that's Bruce Willis the whole time. Like, you don't realize that until the very end. Hairpiece? What are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about? I thought that was Rion Seacrest. Uh, and then, you know, he, he tried to, to repeat the success with Bruce Willis and Unbreakable. And then Signs came out and I, I had good expectations for it. And I walked out of that theater completely upset. I was like, this is a trash movie. I didn't go see it 11 times in theater. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So for me, leading up to signs, I was like, I would say, yeah, he's definitely got some momentum. I wouldn't have put him right out the gate like, oh, next Spielberg. But I would say he had momentum. And then it obviously uh, tapered off rather quickly. Right, right. Now, had you seen Unbreakable before you had seen signs or did you jump from six cents to signs? Cause I know unbreakable didn't have as much advertising uh, directed towards it marketing. Excuse me. Uh, no, I saw six cents and then unbreakable and then signs. Oh, you did. Okay. All right. Gotcha. I did not, I didn't see unbreakable till years and years later. I, I was in, I was in like my early twenties when I saw it. Um, Gary, how about you? Where were, uh, where were you at on that, on that rodeo? Did you think that Shyamalan had the potential to be the next big A-list director? Yeah, Based off those first three. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that uh, Signs was uh, probably his best film that he's done so far. And then I, I also saw Unbreakable and then uh, I'm sorry, um, Six Sense was the best film. And then I also saw Unbreakable and Signs. And I thought mm-hmm. all three of those movies, uh, he did a really good job of showing us something different that you don't often see in film. It was a much different pace. Like the length of the cuts of uh, uh, the shots was much longer on a lot of them. And it was much more toned down and kind of really uh, 
brought down to the individual level as most movies that you saw around that time. And I thought that he had right. a really unique way of telling a story. And I really liked all three of those movies, um, Sixth Sense, uh, Unbreakable, and Signs. I, th I thought, man, this is a guy that um, he's really versatile. Like, he can tell a story that's, um, you know, like kind of a horror story with Sixth Sense, um, kind of a, a comic book story with uh, Unbreakable. And uh, kind of also a um, like uh, a horror story slash, uh, you know, finding your faith story that you, you had from Signs. And uh, like all three of those movies to me were very strong movies. Um, and then uh, I don't know, maybe he got like a, a stroke or something. I don't know. But st things changed <laughs> after that. <laughs> they did they did indeed uh and i don't for me i you know seeing seeing all three of those uh and like i said i hadn't seen unbreakable until later but just like uh michael just like you i actually saw signs in theaters i only saw it about i think i saw it three or four times in theaters um but i really like i'd always been a mel gibson fan growing up my dad was just really liked him um and so i i had just always really loved his movies you know um if you look at so it, so it's interesting just for context if you look at the first three big films that steven spielberg did they were the ones that really set him apart there was jaws in 75 close encounters with the third kind was 77 and then i'm going to skip over 1941 and you had raiders of the lost ark why are you skipping so over I'm 1941 just, that's a great movie well, it's not as big and didn't have as big of a budget. It's not as well known as the other three. So I would just say if I was to compare, because technically, you know, M. Night Shyamalan's first film was was this other one, the the Wide Awake. Um, so I would say comparing comparing Six Sense Unbreakable and Signs to Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and um, Jaws. Excuse me, and Jaws. Thank you um, for all of those you know, getting, getting in on it. I don't think that with the exception of maybe six cents, I don't think his first three were nearly as memorable or even it's not even, I don't really think it's even comparable. So yeah, no, I think the comparison that a lot of people were making that he is the next Spielberg is just way overrated. Even if we're just comparing these first three big movies that he had his first three hits, um, because they were all commercially successful. I, I don't, I don't know. Like uh, everybody um, in '99 was saying, like I see dead people. Like that was like is that's one movie though. Yeah, that's not all three of them. Yeah, but I mean, like uh, that was that was a, like as much as like uh, just when you thought it was safe to go back into the water that Jaws two had. You know, uh, <laughs> we're gonna need a bigger boat. Yeah, um, yeah. like that was a. That was that was a hell of a movie. Like that was uh, sure. an, an interesting and intriguing movie because it kept you guessing, like what's happening here. Like because people, I don't think had felt audiences hadn't felt um, asked to rise to the occasion of trying to figure out a movie in quite a while. Like mm -hmm. um, so, I I think that Sixth Sense really was uh, a, a lot of people really liked it because it it. it require the audience to, and i don't want to spoil anything for a 22 year old movie oh. but oh for guys <laughs> oh my god so old. <laughs> yeah, if you haven't seen it it's your own fault folks <laughs> but uh bruce willis is dead throughout the movie and um he's uh being talked to by Haley joe osmond um you know who who sees dead people and that um like at the end of the movie that's like a huge reveal and i think that um he got a little hooked on that like um uh trying to make a big hook at the end of the movie where something happens that you yeah. don't expect to have happen. Sure. And that kind of, uh, moved into his downfall, uh, for the middle and latter half of his career. Yeah. I, I would totally agree with you. I would totally agree with you on, on that last portion that that led to his downfall and, and we'll, yeah, we'll certainly jump into this commercial success leading to him having more production companies coming in and kind of forcing him to be more Hollywood mainstream than how he had been in his first couple films. But as far as comparing him to Spielberg, like at least for me personally, I don't, you guys might disagree, but out of the three that I mentioned for Spielberg between Jaws, Close Encounters of the Third Kind and Raiders of the Lost Ark, I would say Jaws and Raiders of the Lost Ark 
are kind of on a lot of people's lists for, let's say, like top 50 best films of all time, if we're just picking from that three list. And from Shyamalan's top three, Unbreakable Signs and Sixth Sense, I would say Sixth Sense is the only one that even comes close to making that top 50 list. Um, I just as much as I agree with you, Gary, that, yeah, absolutely. Sixth Sense was fantastic. I've seen it uh, probably a dozen times over my life, maybe 10. I don't know. Um, you know, it's certainly it's quotable. It's 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 memorable. It has a it has a great acting tandem between a young Haley Joel Osment before he just disappeared and and Bruce Willis, you know, showing that he can act even when it doesn't seem like he's acting, you know, um, which is which is which is another profoundly interesting way of acting. Um, didn't even know you could do that. You know, exhibit a Keanu Reeves. Mm. Haley you Joel know? Osment has actually so, oh, resurfaced in uh, The Boys, right? Yeah, and Tusk. If you haven't yeah. seen Tusk, yeah. Kevin Smith's Walrus film, <laughs> go see it. It's a great film. Yeah. Johnny, I just want to circle to back to what you just said. Uh, I just looked up uh, AFI's the American Film Institute's top 100 list, and uh-huh. Raiders, uh, Close Encounters, and Jaws are all three in the top 100. And right on. Signs, uh, Unbreakable, and The Sixth Sense. None of them are in the top 100. Really? Okay. So, so, what's so the fact checking. <laughs> thank you this is Mostly this is why we got calls. i i and, and you know we, we we talk about on our on our last episode and once again guys if you haven't seen it go check it out talking about um you know critics being overrated nowadays and you know afi falls into that list even though i'll still i like you i'll go back and if i'm researching something that's typically where i'll start you know i'll start at imdb or afi and, and see where where their heads are at before i start researching and making a decision um but yeah i you know i, I think that they 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 crowned him they crowned him the next up and coming king of cinema of hollywood and it was premature and i think they should have waited a little bit or michael it goes back to what you were talking about earlier i'd rather be remembered and referred to as michael payne the director he's really good at these things not michael payne the next up and coming of alfred hitchcock or orson wells or steven spielberg or whoever you know, um, I think and that then 10 years down the line where it's who was that guy again? <laughs> exactly. Oh God, please don't talk about him. Yeah. God, please don't say anything. Please <laughs> don't mention his name. It's like Voldemort. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I, I think that all that pressure that they put on him in his earlier years, really, he felt the weight of it and it just came crashing down. You know, I don't think he was necessarily a one hit wonder like a lot of a lot of us talk about um i do think he's had some other decent films we'll get into in here in a second but yeah i don't think comparing him to spielberg that early in his career was was positive at all and i mean you know they're you know they siskel and ebert and the times like a lot of these big publications and movie critics they're talking about how talented he is and they can't wait for the great things to to come from him i think it was just he has too much you know some people crumble under the expectations so Maybe that's what happened here. Who I, knows? I, I will say that I think that M. Night Shyamalan does like and love film and movies. Oh, sure. Because um, yeah. I, I, there are a lot of directors, I think, that don't that really couldn't give two dams about it. Um, but like, I think M. Night Shyamalan does really uh, care about movies and, tr- and try his hardest on them. Um, I just think that the last three quarters of his movies that he's put out really haven't landed the way he he would have liked them to have landed. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, totally totally agree with you on that one. Um well, and with with M. Night Shyamalan, especially these first three movies, I've always kind of wondered too how much I guess for lack of a better term, help he got in making these movies. Um how much outside mm-hmm. influence was able to change the, the course or the direction of the movie. And then as they became right. more popular and as he he made a bigger name for himself, he was able to take more and more creative control over these things to the point that he didn't have those outside influences anymore telling him like, hey, this ain't a great idea. Because I remember um I, I was trying to remember if I was reading it or if I saw it in a documentary, but Originally in the movie Signs, uh, M. Night Shyamalan was trying to push the movie without a soundtrack. He wanted no music in the movie whatsoever. And Signs is, I mean, it's uh, James Howard. Was it James Howard? I think was the composer um, mm-hmm. for all three of the first ones for Six Sense, Unbreakable, and for Signs. And he won a bunch of awards for the music that was in Signs. And it took them basically convincing M. Night Shyamalan to have 
music in that movie because his entire goal was again to try to make something that audiences hadn't really seen before or at least hadn't seen in a very long time and he wanted the story itself to try and stand on its own without the backdrop of music supporting it and can you imagine that movie without (laughs) music how bad that would have been signs would have been much much different yes i i agree to that but yeah, I, I, I will say that, I, that one of the things I appreciate about M. Night Shyamalan is that he um, tends to make cameos in movies, his movies. And I know that that's kind of a point of contention for all of us because some of us think that's a good thing. Some of us think that's a bad thing. But um, I like he's not the best actor in the world, much like Quentin Tarantino. Like it's like this is clearly not an actor. Kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but like, I, I don't know, it, it adds, you know, especially if it's just a small little part, you know, like, I, I think that's, you know, I, I like that as a little touch to like, say, Hey, I'm the director. Here's, here's me in the movie, you know, just my personal mm-hmm. opinion. Yeah. You like, you like seeing, you like seeing those guys going full out and look, I mean, you know, some, there are certainly some directors who put themselves in films and they're, they're not bad actors or anything like that. Um, I, and I've always been a pretty pretty large advocate of not having directors in their films just because for the most part they're not very they're not very genuine when when they're they, it doesn't come across as authentic like they're actually the character it just comes across as they're cold reading from a script and it takes me out of the scene um and that's just me Shyamalan I will say is better is better than Tarantino I think um oh, and yeah. see, here's the thing yeah. though Tar- Tarantino in in you know in reservoir dogs and his little cameo that he had in pulp fiction those were okay you know but i just keep going back to django unchained when he had that us uh, that horrible australian accent and it just took me right out of that scene where they captured jamie fox and they're about to transport him to the um whatever whatever camp they were going to um but yeah no i mean yeah that's it's certainly you got to tip your hat to uh to those guys for attempting to you know hit the trifecta kind of thing I will tell you whose cameos I do enjoy seeing in films, and that's Stan Lee. Oh yeah, yes. absolutely. Well, that's that's obvious. Yeah, he he's just. I mean, it's that's the perfect amount. You know, that's a really good point. I think that's the perfect amount to put in somebody who was, if they're not the director, you know, they were influential in creating the universe the film is being made in, uh, and that you put them in for like one or two comedic lines, and then that's it. And that's Nothing it. Else. Yep. Yep. Neil, what, the, yep. What what is your favorite Stan Lee cameo, Neil? Uh, I mean, he's been in just about everything that I could think of as far as the Marvel Universe goes. Uh, I did enjoy him in, um, <laughs> when he was the collector. Um, oh, in, uh, was that, was that Thor 2? In Guardians of the Galaxy? Yeah, in, or, uh, yeah, Guardians of the Galaxy, yeah. When he, when he, oh, okay. When he was, okay, yeah, no, I guess I don't remember him being the collector. I thought that was Benicio Del Toro. That, that, that's just perfect. Like, he's been in, what, there's 20-something Marvel films, 30-something, whatever, however many, and he's been in every one. And, you know, if you go back, you're always looking for when's he going to pop up? You know, is he going to be dressed in a costume? Is he going to be, is he just going to, you're going to hear his voice? You know, are you going to recognize him at all? You know, uh, so it, it's, it's a fun, it's a nice little Easter egg to look for, for sure. Mm. You know? Um, so let's jump in really, let's jump in here to M. Night Shyamalan actually does not have that many films that he's written and directed over the last couple of decades. He's got a, a fair amount, but compared to other big name directors, he actually uh, has has a little less, even though we've probably all heard of at least the majority of them. Um, so I want to skip over Wide Awake because we don't really know much about that one. But I do want to jump into the Sixth Sense. So we start we start at the beginning, you know, a guy that kind of hit his stride really early on um you know kind of like uh, and then kind of fell off kind of like the i guess uh, orson wells like peter jackson or something you know they had one they had one or two really big films that kind of the mainstream media really loved and they came in droves to see but then it just kind of dropped off so Sixth Sense. Uh, basically uh as gary was uh, letting us know earlier uh m night uh, excuse me uh, basically, Bruce Willis is a child psychologist, and he has won a bunch of awards from the city of Philadelphia, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and you go throughout the film, and he's meeting with Haley Joel Osment, because Haley Joel Osment has had trouble at school, and uh, he gets bullied and whatnot. He's a social outcast, and his we think, at least, that his mother has called for this 
psychiatrist or counselor to come and talk to him and try to figure out what it is exactly that's keeping him from making friends. Okay. Um, so raised by a single mom, you know, he works a bunch, he's by himself a lot kind of thing. And basically we just go throughout the film and you just, you see that he, the famous line, I see dead people. You know, I talk to them every day. They come up to me, they walk past me, they look at me, they say things. Uh, and it's about how Bruce Willis helps him deal with him being a median, uh, uh, basically. And he's saying, instead of being afraid of these monsters, help them, ask them what they need. And as soon as uh, he takes this, as soon as Haley Joel Osment takes the advice, uh, then his life begins to turn around. Then at the very end of the movie, we see that Bruce Willis is the guy with the hairpiece. And excellent. That's, excellent. Yeah, excellent. That's the big reveal. <laughs> no, that's the reveal. No, obviously, Bruce Willis has been dead the entire film, and he finally finds it out at the very end. And there's it's it was really cool because in that movie, nobody actually ever directly talks to Bruce Willis or looks at him outside of Haley Joel Osment, with the exception of at the very beginning of the movie in the opening scene where we see his former his former patient break into his home and then, you know, pulls a gun out and and points it at him and shoots. It obviously goes black. So we just I don't know when I, I saw it as a kid. So I obviously never thought when I first saw it that he would have been dead. I just kind of thought it was one of those things where he got shot and the, the EMS came and they saved his life. You know, um, but yeah, I don't know. Up to that point, nobody would have ever thought, OK, well, he's dead. Now we're following a dead guy around. Yeah, exactly. It was the perfect plot twist, you know, and it's it's sad that that's plagued Shyamalan for the last 20 years of film. Um, Michael, what was your first what did you what was your first kind of interpretation of the film when you saw it? Like after the plot twist came out, after you saw it, we were obviously all, you know, in our teenage years at that point. Um, but what did you think? What did you think when you first saw it? What was your what was your take? Uh, the big thing that I always remember about the Sixth Sense is how actually my grandmother reacted to it. She um, it was kind of strange because she was basically bored by the entire movie. Right. Um, my grandmother didn't go to see a whole lot of films. Uh, she had a bad experience with a movie that scared the crap out of her as a kid. Oh. Uh, so she like never really went to the theater anymore. Wh which, but she decided which movie? that. Uh, surprisingly enough, Frankenstein. Okay. Uh, okay. Scared her really, really badly as a child. Um, long story short, she went to go. See, her uncle went to go take her to go see the movie. She was scared, crying. Her father, who was a pastor, um, is her father. Her grandfather was a pastor. Said, you know, things like this shouldn't exist. This is terrible. And decided to pray about it that night. And that night, lightning struck the movie theater and burned it to the ground. So, yeah, this was, yeah, way back in the 30s. So, like, she's not going to see movies no more. Yeah, is basically what that came down to. But I think Sixth Sense by that time had come out on TV or or yeah. rental or however we were doing it. And she ended up watching it. I think she fell asleep halfway through the movie. Mm -hmm. And when she woke up, the first thing out of her mouth was, "Did they ever reveal he was dead yet?" <laughs> Like she had figured so she, out she super knew. early on. Yeah. Well, she was like, okay. "It's like a watered down masterpiece theater." is the mm -hmm. way that she described that film. So unfortunately, my my uh, view on that film is colored by that for the remainder of my life. I won't ever see it as anything other than watered down masterpiece theater. OK, all right. Uh, but uh, so for you, though, uh, was it was it mind blowing average or was it just a horrible piece of trash? It wasn't. It's was probably looking back at the time. It was probably like, whoa, that was really cool. I wouldn't call it mind blowing. Um, but it probably was our generation's first introduction to what would be considered like a meme yeah. when it was like the, I see dead people sure. thing everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. I never thought of it like that. Uh, Gary, what about you? What was your takeaway from the first time seeing it? Uh, the sixth sense movie I think was really well done. Like for me, um, the plot twist was, it wasn't. Uh, not obvious, but I, it was something that you wouldn't have expected from a, you know, a major motion picture to have the leading character be dead throughout the whole thing. So, um, like I, I really enjoyed Sixth Sense. I thought they did a really good job with that. I, I, I thought that the, uh, one of my favorite things about it is the use of red, like the yeah, color sure. red, like it, when you watch the movie the first time, that's something that'll pop out to you. Cause, uh, they pick, 
like this bright crimson red to represent things that are important or people that are dead or things like that. And so you can start seeing that throughout the movie. And it's kind of fun because you're like, oh, OK, I I, I'm, I picked that up and now I'm understanding where it's coming from um, and like what it's like trying to highlight to me, which I, I think is it's fun for audiences to be like, OK, uh, I see, you know, even though it's maybe a simple uh hidden easter egg you have but uh, i'm on board with you on it so let's let's see where this takes us and i i, I think uh six cents was uh I, I wouldn't say it was like a phenomenal groundbreaking movie that never had been done before but i i think it was a really strong first entry and that's really probably what has given him the gas to continue his career the way he has yeah yeah, he's been able to just kind of be good. He's really just been able to slide by on his name recognition for this entire time. And rightfully so on these this this the first couple ones, at least on this one that we talked about. Um, Sixth Sense was nominated for, you know, six Oscars, including Haley Joel Osment and the original screenplay best film. Uh, so it did well. It did. It did well back in the day and garnered a lot of support from a lot of people. Uh, so I, I totally agree with you on that one. Neil, what about you? What was your takeaway from it when you saw it for the first time? I mean, I agree. Um, you know, obviously the twist was was unexpected for me, but I think overall the movie had been really well shot, and yeah. I thought it had been framed really well. The fact that, you know, up until the end when you don't know that Bruce Willis is dead, he's in rooms with people having conversations, and he's chiming in on conversations, and you think everyone's talking to each other, but if you go back knowing that he's dead, you're like, holy shit, yeah, they're yeah. not even talking to him. No one you looks know, his I, way. Yeah, I think, you know, it's subtleties like that that I didn't pick up on the first time. But, you know, uh, like I said, I thought it was shot well, framed well and and helped add to the overall hook at the end. Yeah, yeah I, I have to agree that I thought that part was just brilliant. Gary, go ahead. Yeah, just, just like uh, kind of piggybacking on Neil's idea, like the uh, the shot where. Uh, it opens with Bruce Willis sitting next to Haley Joe Osment's mom, and they're in the apartment. And you, as an audience member, are like, okay, they were talking about Haley Joe Osment before the scene started, but that wasn't the case. And like playing with the audience like that, I think is 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 really intriguing with a director to do. Um, and yeah. So like, I, I that to me was one of the the highlights of the movie. Yeah, I thought it was brilliant how they were. I mean, especially the scene where he goes to dinner with his wife. And they sit down. And he's like, I'm sorry, I'm late. I'm sorry, I'm late. And they bring the check and he kind of reaches for it. And she just grabs it immediately, signs it really quick and goes, happy anniversary and just walks off, doesn't look at him. And she went to dinner that night because it was their anniversary and he'd been dead for, you know, how are we, a year or so. Yeah. Um, and you're like, and just, OK, she just pissed off at him. And yeah. She's she could, storming out. But no. Yeah. Exactly. Because, you know, they're sleeping in separate rooms and she won't talk to him. Yeah. It's just. That portion was brilliant. I can't remember a movie before Six Sense that came out that ever positioned a character's final outcome in that light. Mm -hmm. I, I don't ever I don't ever remember anything coming out, you know, pre-99 that that attempted to do that. Um, and now, you know, nowadays, a lot of people are copying it. So, I, you know, that's why I thought for me, that was mind blowing. I thought this film in particular, this is. I don't it's. <sighs> I don't know if it's my favorite film of his just from an entertainment standpoint, but as far as the best overall movie he did, checks all those boxes on the cinema list. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I, I hope that after I die, my wife will continue to live in uh, somber solace. Uh, exactly. And, and yeah. go go out on our anniversary. Yeah, yeah. And just never just never wet again, you know, never yeah. sleep with another I, man. No, you know? I, I wanted to be miserable like she lost me. Yeah. Yeah, I'm the be I'm the best thing since sliced bread. She sh should be missing my aunt. Yeah, you better bring kryptonite, bitch, because I'm Superman. Oh shit! Okay, it's chess. It ain't checkers. Okay. <laughs> Remember the Titans. <laughs> Remember <For> the Titans. <laughs> oh, these are all the wrong movies. King Kong ain't got shit on me. Rainy day. Uh, <laughs> honestly, like you know, with I mean, the fact that the budget on this was forty million and then grossed almost seven hundred million that that just that just boggles it just boggles the mind none of his other films even came close to that um i mean yeah, either no they didn't none of his films ever came close to that you know and for me this is a biased opinion when i was so this was i was about 11 when it came out i was about 12 when i first saw it okay and when i first saw it 
that was really the first film that I saw that started my obsession with the horror and suspense thriller genres. And so for me, I just have a lot of fond memories of watching this movie and it scared the crap out of me as a kid. Like it really did. I know it, it didn't really have a ton of jump scares and it had a couple, but you know, for the most part, he really just, it's, it's like a, it's that slow burn with, I was talking about with James Wan or, or even a Hitchcock film, you know? Um, yeah. And they, I, they, yeah. I, I was gonna say, I, I agree with that. Like one of the things about it might Shyamalan is that, his budgets are relatively small compared to most Hollywood movies. Like you might have like nine or 10 million or 15 or 20 million. Um, but like he doesn't go crazy with his budget, like, uh, like a Marvel movie will. So like mm-hmm. a, a lot of his shots, um, by necessity, therefore have to be kind of tight and contained and they're not filled with just like ridiculous, uh, over the top special effects. Um, right. and I, I think that's one of, I don't know if he necessarily makes that choice or if he just has to do that because he can't get a larger budget than that. But I think that it's a good choice that is, is, has been made for him. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I would have to agree. I, for, for me, for me, this one was mind blowing. Um, I I get Michael, you still said it was between average and mind blowing. Gary, Gary, where are you at? Is this, is this like, is this mind blowing or is this just kind of, is it just okay? Yeah, I, I wouldn't put it at the mind blowing level, but uh, like I'd put it like it between uh, average and mind blowing. Like I, I think it was a good, solid film that uh, had a lot of uh, strong pieces and elements to it. Um, yeah. So I, like I was, I was very uh, happy with it. I thought it was a great, great movie. Okay, Neil, how about you? Same, uh, not mind blowing, but definitely entertaining and unexpected. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I'll be alone in this one. Uh, just, you know, still absolutely loved it. I actually got, I showed my sister the movie and my sister and I are about 12 years apart. Uh, she's, she's a little much younger, but she had never seen it. And so a couple of years ago we were at a family's place and I saw it come on HBO and I was like, we have to watch this. And just, I got super giddy and really excited to show it to her. I don't, maybe it's just because it was a, such a big part of my teenage and adolescent years. Um, that I just wanted to, you know, pass it on. So uh, moving on from that, uh, we jump into 2000 where Unbreakable pops out. Uh, Michael, why don't you give us a breakdown of Unbreakable? Just a quick little synopsis there. I do not remember this movie. I'm in the same boat as. Damn it! I am <laughs> just I am just 0 for two on this one. That's okay. It's all right. It's 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 all right. Um. Uh. So, uh, uh, Gary, do you it. remember? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Go ahead. So Unbreakable is a really interesting movie because it's kind of like a comic book superhero movie in the way that it's uh, right. filmed and framed and shot. And like the story of like, cause uh, Bruce Willis plays this guy that has um, really destructible, basically. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. It's like really modest superpowers. Like he doesn't get sick. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's, he's, I don't want to say nigh invulnerable, but like he's, he's tough. Like, uh, he, and he's got like a weakness. It's water. And then he has a superpower of like being able to like touch somebody and see whatever, evil thing they've done in their past. So right. it it starts out and the cool thing in the movie is like Bruce Willis does not know that he's a superhero because he's just this guy living his life and he just happens he survives all of these crazy do you remember he like survives that giant train crash yeah. that he was on. He was the only survivor. Um he was like unscathed completely. Um yeah it's just these weird superpowers. Yeah and like you know he's like so he he doesn't even realize that he's the superhero. And then Samuel L. Jackson who's in the movie um which may be after Jurassic Park, Samuel L. Jackson's best role, um, mm. like he um, is trying to uh, uncover. Mr. Glass. Yeah, he's trying to uncover the like if um, Bruce Willis is a superhero or if he's not, because uh, you know he's really he was really into comic books because his whole life he was really smart, but like he was like really fragile, which is why they called him Mr. Glass because his bones would break all the time. Um, so mm. like, and it, it just. Like, it's such a subtle story. Like, you look at, like, Marvel comic books, and those are, like, full-on comic book movies. And then you look at, like, Watchmen, and that's, like, kind of, like, this is a comic book movie, but it's also kind of grounded in reality. And then, like, Mm -hmm. Unbreakable is even, like, a step below. So it's just, like, just a little bit above what, you know, normal life would be. But, but 
uh, enough that it's it it's it kind of it kind of pulls you out of that and kind of has a little bit of a superhero. And I, I think that uh, that movie was just really well done in the way that it was paced because like. At the start of the movie, at least for the first half, you're like, is this is Bruce Willis a superhero or is he not? Because his son certainly thinks or his kid certainly thinks he is a superhero. But kids often think that their parents are like super heroic. So like, is is it real or is it not? And then you've got that like great scene where he's like pumping iron and like he's just like mm-hmm. keep adding more and more weight. And then like he puts yeah. the, the he puts all the weights on. He's like, OK, put the paint buckets on. He puts the paint buckets on. And he's like and then the kid's like, we don't have anything else to put on. And like, you know, it, it's just, <laughs> it like like it's just and then like like but you also have like these really realistic scenes like his kid thinks that his dad's a superhero. So he gets a gun out and he's going to shoot his dad. And he's like, look, if you shoot me, I'm going to die. And like, it, it was just, it was really just a well paced and well mixed movie. Um, and like, yeah. I, I, I still think that was, you know, very, one of his very strong contenders still like, uh, he was yeah. red hot at the time. I think a lot of, I think a lot of people nowadays, the general audience, they like a film Certainly, that is super out of this world. You know, you look at we always bring up Marvel because, well, they're most of them are just really good fucking movies. Uh, But back then, especially, I think a lot of people liked stories that were a little whimsical, a little bit fantasy, but still in the realm of possibility. And I agree with you that it's it was so subtle, the powers that they had, you know, Mr. Glass ended up being the supervillain. He started, you know, he started killing all of these people and he was the one that caused that train wreck and he caused, you know, this bus of school children to explode. And he caused, you know, this, this sunken hole in some other part of the world, trying to find his adversary, like trying to find, cause he was the intelligent one and he wanted to find his Superman, his Lex Luthor, his Superman kind of thing. Um, and they just took it to a very low plane level. You know, it was kind of like when we played D and D, uh, we did that Marvel campaign and you talked about street level heroes, you right, know? Yeah. Um, I think that both of these guys would fall into street level heroes and villains, that category. And I liked that. That was really cool. You know, it had a very dark, ominous tone to it. Uh, and it wasn't, it wasn't a graphic novel like Watchmen and it wasn't over the top, lots of fun, lots of color and tons of explosions like any of the Marvel or DC films, at least Marvel films. Uh, so yeah, I, for me, this was one I hadn't seen till later on. I didn't think it was really over the top mind blowing. I didn't really think it was average though. I thought it was, I thought it was good. I, you know, kind of scale one to 10. I, I'd probably give it a, I'd probably give it a seven, you know, or maybe a, a six and a half. Like I thought it was still a good follow up to six cents. I wasn't expected to be completely blown out of the water with this one. And I wasn't, but I did enjoy watching it. I've seen it twice, I think. And I, I'd, I'd watch it again if it was on TV kind of thing. Um, so, Neil, what was your takeaway from the first time you had seen it? Because I think you said you saw it when you were a teenager, right? You saw it right after Sixth Sense? Yeah. So to me, it was a good follow follow up from the Sixth Sense. It was nice that there wasn't a backslide. I thought it was still a very solid movie. I love how you put it that they were like street level, you know, heroes and villains. It's a great way to, to look at it. And uh, I just thought it, it was a solid film. And it was a good follow up for uh for coming off that high on on six cents yeah yeah uh michael what about you what did you think unbreakable from your first take i mean it was it was a solid film it's not the greatest film ever but it was it was fun to watch yeah just average, just average run-of-the-mill kind of thing i think that's how a lot of people felt about it it didn't get panned by critics but nobody said oh this is the best thing since sliced bread you know people weren't drinking the the Shyamalan kool-aid at that point you know, it hadn't gotten to that hype but yeah it wasn't a huge fall off like some of his other films we'll get to um gary what, what were you i know you gave us a synopsis but what did you think of the movie as a whole you know even compared to six cents uh, i thought i thought it was a really well done movie like i'd, I'd probably give it like an eight out of ten or seven and a half at oh least. that's pretty that's pretty high okay, yeah pretty and like one of the things that Say what you will about M. Night Shyamala. One of the things that he does do is he will write and direct new stories every time. Does so he, he doesn't mm-hmm. like find one that's successful and then continues to do it. Granted, he did come back and revisit uh, Unbreakable later on in his career. But like yeah. he'll he'll take out new stories and they may be terrible <laughs> stories, but like he will 
uh, like it's not going to be a sequel. Like he'll he'll start a new story completely, and I yeah. I appreciate that in a storyteller that they're willing to, uh, you know, try something new, even though it may be a failure. Um, the guy goes down with the ship, that's for sure. Like he'll he'll ride or die with his scripts. He doesn't pass it off on to anybody else, being like, oh, production got in the way, whatever. He's like, this is what I wanted to write about, and this is what I did, and accept it or don't accept it. You know, like that. That's it. Um, but it and once again, here's the thing we talk about with all of his films outside of Wide Awake. You know, it it's seventy five million dollar budget, you know, basically it doubled the budget from six cents and he still made two hundred and fifty million on it at the box office. So it's a gigantic it's a really, really gigantic downfall from where the box office grossing budget from six cents came from or profit from six cents came from. But uh, he still, you know, they they still made you know, three, four times that the amount on the budget. So good for him. So he still kept his head above water long enough to, you know, get that next contract, get that next production company uh, funding his next pro- his next film. We hope that you are enjoying this rousing episode of Let Feather Productions' I Don't Give a Flick. To help us bring you more of the content that you love, please consider following us on Patreon at patreon.com slash leadfeather. There are three tiers to choose from, with special and exclusive merchandise in our VIP level. We now return you to your regularly scheduled programming. Uh, so to jump into, let's jump into signs really quick. Michael, I'm let you give the synopsis since you are probably the resident expert on it with your 11 times in theaters. Uh, give us a quick rundown of what happened in this one. Signs. Signs is the telling of the story of Macaulay Culkin's asthmatic brother. It's a wonderful tale. Oh, Rory. Um, yeah. Rory. So <laughs> one is Rory. Yeah. So Signs is kind of a it's it's a story about a man who is struggling with his faith and struggling with why things happen the way they happen, and at the same time dealing with this threat of an alien invasion at the same time. So it's this weird kind of juxtaposition of, of science fiction and internal strife of, of man versus God type yeah. type conflict. And you go through the whole story, seeing that there are all of these things that have happened in his life or have happened in the town or has happened to his son, happened to all the people around him that eventually it leads to an inevitable conclusion. And you start to realize that, the moral of the story is things happen for a reason. And that's the message that they're pushing through the entire film. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's just a fun, fun. It's an interesting, <laughs> uh, interesting way to see somebody lose and regain their faith just right. through this very kind of crazy process of extraterrestrial invasion. Yeah. What, I, what I do appreciate about Shyamalan, I- at least in a lot of his films is that he does have two very contradicting themes or two very, excuse me, two very conflicting themes that he always tries to press on and he's there and it's, 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 it's right on the nose and it's right in your face. And he doesn't try to deviate from that on, at least on these first three. And so I do appreciate that with the guy. So seeing signs 11 times in theaters as a kid and loving it, and then seeing it again as an adult, what's your take on it now? What did you think? I mean, I still think it's, I still think it's fun to watch, but probably more fun from a nostalgia point of view at a certain point in time in my life. But sure. the story definitely is not great, and it's got a whole bunch of plot holes, and there's a lot of stuff that really doesn't make sense. <laughs> but the whole the whole point of the thing is is just having faith that things are happening the way they're supposed to happen. So I don't know. That's probably just an excuse for poor writing. But it's I definitely liked it a lot better when I was yeah. younger. Sure. You know, I, I definitely it it struck some kind of chord with me that that just kept me going back to the theater. So seeing mm-hmm. it now, it's it's definitely not the same, but it's it's swing still worth away, watching. Meryl, swing, yeah, away. swing away. That's right. Swing away. It's like, That's his right. lungs were closed. No poison got in. His lungs were closed. <laughs> no poison got in. Why, why why would an a, a superior alien race come to a planet that's c- covered by seventy five percent 
covered of by water, which is poisonous to them. That yeah. makes a lot of sense. Well, <laughs> not even that. that. It's like the humidity <laughs> in the atmosphere. Like in, 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 his, de- in, in his defense, like War of the Worlds, like they all got the aliens got beaten by a cold. Yeah. So I mean, like, yeah. Yeah. Right. And, you know, actually, a lot of a lot of films do that with aliens. They it's water. Water is their, you know, or our atmosphere is the main reason that they start dying off. Why? If they're such a superior race, why wouldn't they be able to figure this out ahead of time? Yeah. I mean, how right. could I, how like, could I, how could one virus bring down a whole civilization? I don't think so. Uh, calm down there. Oh, yeah. oh. Oh god, I have another screwdriver. Yeah. Um, <laughs> He's getting more what was, sober. <laughs> what was fun about signs is because it it definitely played on the jump scares a lot. Like it there's did. there's multiple of multiple of them throughout the film. Right. But they were done in such a way that it wasn't like over the top. You know how over yeah. the top. You know how a lot of times nowadays when they do the jump scares, and they were especially doing it from like the late two thousands to maybe the mid two thousand tens, where the jump scares were designed with three D in mind. Right. So everything had to be coming towards the screen or it had to be, you know, in your face right there. Like there there was one of those in the movie when the when the hand or the claw comes out from under the door, but the other jump scares in the movie that really, you know, freaked people out was you know, when he looks out the window and suddenly realizes that there's somebody standing on the barn across the way, like staring yeah. through the window. That's so never... the shit out of me. Yep, because it's like a crazed drug addict outside your house. Like, that's yeah. what it makes you think of. And right. at that time, they didn't know it was aliens. But um, you had the, the little kid's birthday party. Oh, when, the, like, the, the, they... fo- the found footage in Brazil. Yep, when it's yeah. like everybody, you know, everything is kind of playing up, playing up, playing up, and you're expecting some big major thing to happen, and all it is is just walking across so you can see them in the alleyway, and yeah. that's it. And it freaked the fuck out of so many people when that happened. And then um, when they were down in the basement, and you had the hand, uh, the the claw that was kind of sitting there outside the coal grate. Wow. Um that was kind of blended in. And then all of a sudden it just barely reached over and touched Rory Culkin and everybody flipped out in the theater. Like there were these jump scares that were involved, but I think they were done well. Like it it wasn't too much. And it it really, it still kind of sticks with a lot of people. Like you can still bring up that scene and people are like, Oh yeah, it freaked me out. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, for me personally, for me personally, it was, I was still in that time period of when I was getting into horror films really big as a teenager. I was 15 when I saw it. And it was that scene where I see you finally the the alien is finally revealed. You get to fully see it in the living room and its reflection is right behind them in that TV screen. And that one that one freaked me out. And I I really appreciated how he allowed our imagination to get the best of us because we've talked about this in other episodes on horror that the scariest thing for us is not jump scares outside of the soundtrack. It is letting the audience's imagination create the monster for them and right. I, I appreciated m night Shyamalan doing that um I, I i would agree with you i guess the i don't know i the, the story the story was i think mediocre honestly i actually thought honestly i i really did think the acting in this was superb and i for the style of movie that it was and for the style of directing that Shyamalan does in all of his films it was right on par with all of them you know i thought Mel Gibson, I actually thought was probably the weakest one out of everybody. But between Abigail Breslin, Rory Culkin and Joaquin Phoenix, I I thought that they all played that very subtle, almost wooden style of acting perfectly to a T. And I I, I appreciated that it fit perfectly with the tone. I thought that the way that they scared you and startled you, even as an adult seeing it again, I'm still pulled in because there's things that I've forgotten. You know, it's been like five or six years since I've seen it again. Right. Still to this day, it still does that for me. So I, I still put that on the level of Unbreakable. I really do. I know that a lot of you guys probably won't agree with me, but I, I still do find it to be a really, a really well done, subtle horror film or sci-fi even, however you want to look at it. Um, Neil, what was your take away from from seeing Signs for the first time? Uh, so after seeing Unbreakable, and I saw the the trailer for Signs, I was kind of hesitant i was like i don't know but i went and saw it and i think one of the biggest things for me was what we talked about earlier and i think m night gave himself too big of a role in this movie the mm-hmm. fact that he was the one that was driving that killed uh, his, wife, yeah. his wife uh, and then he comes to the farm and talks to him and stuff um that 
kind of took it out for me because I have never thought he was a very good actor. Sure. Um, I thought the uh, the visual effects were subpar even for the time. Like oh. I don't think the aliens really meshed well as far as visually with what was going on in the environment. Uh, I thought some of the dialogue was kind of cheesy. Um, oh. like, like there's a time when he's trying to comfort the kids and he's just like, go eat some fruit or something. It's like, uh, I don't know. It's yeah. weird. Um, but, you know, overall, I, I get it. I see that it, I see that the aliens were, were injured by water because water is kind of like a holy symbol. It's kind of how he helped find his faith again. I get all that. Um, so it was not a bad movie, but it was definitely not on par with his first two for me. Okay. Okay. Uh, Gary, what about you? Oh, I think any movie that uh, a man's wife is held together by the compression of a vehicle versus a tree is a great movie. <laughs> you're just on, <laughs> you're just on this the the, the death and hey, wife uh, trope. I, all it could have been a Fast and Furious movie. Yeah, it yep. could have been. <laughs> it's about family. Um, yeah, I mean, like uh, Signs is. I do like Signs. I think that it's uh, yeah. uh, like the the again the way that it's shot. Like because um, I think. Uh, the Tom Cruise movie War of the Worlds came out around that time yeah. or some sort, and like that movie is like a, later, yeah. like a really big like uh, worldwide kind of catastrophe, like major motion picture about you know the War of the Worlds. Whereas Signs is like really uh, it's kind of the same story about the world being invaded by aliens, but it's just really narrow to this one family and how they react to all that. And I think that was a really brilliant play on. M. Night Shyamalan's part to kind of focus in the entire tale yeah. to just just these the like, isolation. Yeah, because it's like these yeah. these guys or these this family on a farm. There's a town nearby, but like the the lady that's the sheriff, like she comes by once in a while. But like you know, it's pretty much just them on the farm. Um, it anytime you have kids in your movie, it's always going to be you know hit or miss whether that works out well for you or not. Um, like, uh, you know, just because the, the way they sometimes deliver lines is not very natural, like to how a kid would do it. Um, and I, I can't remember the name of the little girl that was in the movie. Um, but like, she, go Breslin. yeah, she was like cute as a button. But some of her lines were like, you know, not really great. But uh, like, I, I, I think that uh, that was still a really solid movie. Like, I, I, you know, I remember them like going out and like he had the little board and he was trying to make the, the signs in the cornfield by like crushing oh. down his corn. Um, and I, I think that uh, it was really interesting to cast Mel Gibson in that part, because yeah. when you think of Mel Gibson, you think of a guy who's like avenging his family member that's killed. Usually. Yeah. And so in this movie, his wife was killed and he doesn't av avenge her. So that was kind of a neat little uh, meta trick on the audience because you think that like he's going to like, you know, have a different reaction than he does. But he ends up, as you said, more focusing on in on his, his faith because he's a pastor. Um Yeah. Like, I, I, I think that that was still a really strong movie. I think it had a lot of, you know, uh, interesting and dynamic uh, characters to it. Uh, it was, you know, with the aliens being susceptible to water, maybe not the best planet in the solar system to invade, but, you know, you got to do what you got to do, you know. <laughs> they, they ran out of gas yeah. by that point. But, like, uh, I still think that was a, a, a strong uh, movie of his and probably the last of his uh, really great movies that he directed because we're going to get into some other movies that are, a little bit downhill from that shortly. We're we're getting we're we're jumping into that right now. Just we'll start picking it up because we're run, running out of running short on time here. But uh, signs seventy two million dollar budget four hundred eight million dollars for gross profit. Uh, once again, I, he's still doing enough to keep him keep his head above water. Um, I think the the films are starting to slide a little bit, but we'll see. Uh, Two thousand four comes around and the village comes out. Uh, for those of you that aren't terribly familiar with this one, uh, we we basically there's a group of Puritans, I suppose you could call them. Uh, they're supposedly in the middle of nowhere trying to colonize this area of the United States uh, or we're led to believe so. But they can't be they can't go outside of the valley that they're in because there are these 
evil i suppose prehistoric maybe mythical beasts um that are as evil as can be but they can't enter the town as long as you stay within the limits of the valley so if you go out into the woods you're going to die and so basically it keeps this entire village of people you know 50 to 100 people or something keeps them in this village uh and keeps them from going out into exploring the world uh so basically uh oh god was it was it Bryce Dallas Howard? I think was the the daughter in that. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah so she has her um, Adrian. She's got her, and then her brother Adrian Brody is. Um, you know, I, I suppose he's autistic or something like that. But she has always wanted to venture past the walls to see what the rest of the world holds. And so finally, we're going to spoilers alert all day long, guys. If you haven't seen these movies, then you know turn it off now or skip forward. But basically, she it goes past the wall, and uh, she finds an actual wall and she climbs over the wall and there's a road on the other side. She's never seen a road before. She doesn't know what the hell this is. Like and a she modern walks across. road, like, you know, yeah, it's like, road like a roadway. Yeah. And she walks across the street. You see M. Night Shyamalan sitting there in, uh, I guess it was a park rangers outpost. And uh, they talk to each other and she needs a first aid kit. Gets the first aid kit goes back. Uh, she's chased through the woods by one of these animals and uh, the, she ends up accidentally killing it. Uh, it ends up being her, her own brother, Adrian Brody, uh, and he just had a mask on, like he had a costume, basically. So we go on to find out that th the elders of this community are actually a group of scientists from a town very close and they were tired of how evil the world had become. And so they created, they took all of their families and they created this fake pre night excuse me like pre 1900 style or pre 1800 style village to live in it's essentially a period piece that we're watching almost um and they are the ones that pretend to be these evil creatures that keep the entire town at bay and inside the uh, borders of of the valley so wasn't, wasn't she blind because that yeah, was the they're... only reason they let her leave is because she wouldn't see the outside world. Like, she was blind. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I totally forgot about that. Okay. Um, well, there you go. Yeah, and so another plot twist. You know, she didn't know she was blind till the end. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> but it's it's once again, it's it's another film. Like, I give M. Night Shyamalan doing period pieces, and this is actually a, a genre we haven't really touched on yet. Doing period pieces is not easy. It's a, It's a very difficult style to do. Um, and especially doing almost a horror period piece is also an even more difficult style to do. Um, I talk about the the witch. Uh, I think, Michael, you said you love that. I personally hated it. Um, but there were a lot of cool things that they they did in that film that we can both agree on. And it's it's not easy to get that across um, to make it interesting. Also, you know, um, the witch is a better movie than the village. I'll give them that. Yeah, um, hands down. <laughs> but again, the witch is like another faith based, losing faith, gaining faith. Yeah, like, exactly. I, I guess exactly. I just like that. But anyway. Yeah, no, no. And hey, the, the witch, there are some scary fucking there's some scary fucking scenes in that movie. It left me. It was eerie as hell. It left me with a weird taste in my mouth. That's for sure. Um, but with with the village, uh, God, man, I they just. It, it, you know, we talk about Shyamalan had done a decent job so far of choosing his first three big films within a realm of possibility and like in this in this film it's based in like it's based in the early 2000s or in the 90s or something and it's in a no-fly zone that's why they've never seen or heard of planes or helicopters going above it it just so happens they happen to be in a no-fly zone at a national park um the fact that no one's gone through that part of the woods the fact that they've never seen smoke rising from the large bonfires these people have or the the meals that they're cooking inside of their chimneys it it just like signs it did have major plot holes um and then it just had this twist at the end that you kind of also saw at the beginning anyways um that he just felt like he needed to save the script i guess i don't know uh i don't know gary what was your thoughts on on the village i i thought it was horrid i thought this was one of his worst films. I don't know. If yeah, it's it was definitely film. a departure from uh, the previous three movies. The thing mm -hmm. I remember most about The Village was um, in, uh, gosh, I think it was ninth grade. I had a math teacher named Miss Flickinger, and we called her okay. Miss Flick. And uh, yeah. she, she was talking about the movie one, t one day. She was like, 
uh, it was pretty obvious that they had, uh, you know, like Walmart clothes on. I mean, it didn't look like actual clothes from like, you know, the, you know, 17th century. And I was like, yeah, you're right. That was a not yeah. a great movie. Um, so I think this is kind of the first movie that M. Night Shyamalan has done where he kind of gets over his skis in terms of like, I need to make a twist. And the twist yeah. is that it's not actually a period piece. It's taking place today. Um, yeah. And I think that like it, it was an interesting concept because you did have like this village and it's surrounded by monsters and like, are these monsters real or are they just like fictitious and like the people being scared? Oh wait, it's taking place today. But I think mm -hmm. that, um, you know, for me, it just, it didn't play out cause it, it, you know, it was either like they had the worst, um, costume designer in the history of Hollywood that was working on that movie or, um, <laughs> they had bought their clothes from something like Walmart, you know, or some, some a, a modern manufactory of clothes. So mm -hmm. I, I don't think that the, the, the twist landed the way that uh, it did in the previous uh, three movies. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It just seemed like that had become his, his calling card at that point was just these insane twists at the end of the films. And that's what he had hung his hat on. It wasn't it wasn't story anymore. It wasn't his, the cinematography or the the framing that he used. You know, we talked about that was Sixth Sense. Um, it wasn't even the soundtrack. You know, it was just it was the twist. It was like everything is weak up until the twist. And even then the twist, you can't save it. You know, a, a 30, a, you know, 10 to 30 second twist. It's not going to save a whole fucking movie. Uh, Michael, what were your thoughts uh, coming out of seeing that one for the first time? I just remember the village making me angry. <laughs> like it was because it was the first time that I felt like if my Shyamalan was telling me I was stupid and that uh -huh. I wouldn't figure it out by the time it was all said and done, mm -hmm. like to go from to go from signs, which obviously I thought was a great movie at the time to then see the village and be like, fuck you. Uh, fuck? <laughs> I was I was angry. So it's just like this flick. I was like, they're wearing normal clothes. They're not speaking in. Like, a, yeah, they're trying to play off this weird dialect, like, oh, yeah, this is what the pilgrims sound like. But you're like, yeah. nope, that's that's not it. That's Something's... a regular Philadelphian accent. You took <laughs> that like, really personally, wrong. Michael. Yes, I did. I <laughs> I think it's because I like period pieces. So it like the movie mm -hmm. made me mad for some reason. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Neil, how about you? What was your thoughts coming out of it? Uh, Yeah, I mean, I felt um. Like I said, I kind of, after Signs, had a kind of a bad taste in my mouth, but I felt obligated to go give the village a shot because, you know, he had done decent up to that point. But I definitely walked out of there, like, upset. Like, I wasted time on this. Like, I felt like he kind of phoned it in. Yeah. Um, just overall, like, he, you know he was trying to put a twist in there, but, you know, 20 minutes into it, you could, you could see it coming. Yeah. I thought it was interesting, yeah. uh, you know, the fact that it was the village elders that were keeping everyone there. But other than that, like, uh, I, it was, it did nothing for me. It just, it, it was, it was just, it was just funny because at this, when signs came around, you started seeing some critics start to break away from hailing him as the next Spielberg, and they started really breaking down his because he had the public eye on him because of Sixth Sense, and then I, I guess Unbreakable, he had such. He had a ton of limelight on him, and he had such a magnifying glass just piercing through on his every work. So everybody was dissecting everything that came out for him. Uh, and so because of that, obviously, he was so popular. Yeah, like we, you know, uh, Michael, you mentioned that earlier. You know, you were wondering at what point did all these production companies start to come in and really start to try to, you know, put a put a, a, a leash on him for a lack of better words and be like, look, here's what you can do. Here's what you can't do. Oh, you can't do the stuff that made you famous at the beginning. Uh, but yeah, you can do a lot of the same crap that made uh, Six Cent so popular with with six, six Oscars. So I, I'm, I'm assuming. Signs was the start and definitely the village uh, continued that going down because that leads us to our next blunder if you ask me with lady in the water um out of all of us here this one is not as popular who has has anybody not seen it i have not seen it after the okay. village i kind of was steering clear of them hey man i don't i don't freaking blame you um so for this one this one was this one was basically uh it was about a it was actually 
kind of funny that we did Eye of the Beholder, you know, a, a short film we did a while back about the an artist who painted the uh, next coming of the the Mona Lisa or, you know, the Last Supper or whatever. And it was supposed to bring the world together. Well, M. Night Shyamalan plays this writer who is supposed to write this amazing it was a story or a book or something. And it's supposed to change the way the world thinks. And it's supposed to bring cultures together and it's supposed to mend fences and create peace because of how amazing the writing style is. Um, and it's based in an old rundown apartment complex. And Paul Giamatti, who's supposed to be the main character, is like the general manager of this I guess, apartment complex or motel or whatever. Um, and uh, you guys have to help me fill in the blanks. It's been a minute since I've seen the entire thing. I've seen it. I saw it once and they just, uh, um, but Bryce Dallas Howard is in it again. She's a fairy or a, a water nymph. Thank you. A uh, water nymph from another universe. And she's being tracked by this wolf that's made of plants. Yeah, and... it can like smash itself down on the ground to hide. Like, yep. yeah, yep. I, it was, yeah. But there's, but there, there, there's also plant monkeys in the trees, and they, they apparently like they like they're the ones that pull the wolf apart at the end. Um, and there's a film critic that is actually there is a film critic. So basically, when Shyamalan wrote this, I remember reading, and especially when it came out, he was pissed off at all of the critics that were saying, oh, he's actually overrated. Oh, he's overblown. We spoke too fast. He's not the next coming of the greatest thing ever. And we should stop seeing his films just based off name recognition. And he was pissy that everybody was dissecting his films over and over again. So he basically... I don't want to. OK, I'm going to say it kind of Neil Breened himself, you know, uh, and he basically Gary, he, he you might agree with me on this. He he made himself kind of this messiah figure in the film, wrote himself in, had the biggest part he's ever had in any of his films in that movie and made himself uh, an author and turn a screenwriter, then put a critic in the movie. And essentially, it was a big fuck you to the industry. And he was like, you guys don't tell me what to do. It's all about the fans. It's all about me, my art. And I don't give a shit what you think. And he just kind of kind of spat in all their faces. And then there's also a scene in the movie where the uh, this film critic who also played he's actually the same actor that played. Um, oh, God, Del Ripple, the guy who was the president at NBC on Seinfeld that oh, was yeah. really interested in George and, and Jerry's uh, show. Um, so it was funny seeing him, seeing him in that, but the, the wolf monster kills him and just like devours him and tears him up. Um, so it was just a really lazy trying, you know, on the nose, I guess, uh, just a really lazy attempt at bashing film critics for bashing him. And it just kind of made him come off like a, a pretentious whiny little bitch like a little, little boy. Basically he came across a little immature, like he spent all this money writing, a a fuck you to the industry um i don't know i i thought the idea was kind of cool uh because it you know it was it was basically he instead of taking it through the eyes of one or two characters you actually saw a lot of screen time from a lot of different side characters and i think it got too convoluted and it just made the story more confusing than it already was um so i honestly this this one might be my least favorite. I don't know, man. The happening was was certainly up there. We'll get to that. Um, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. So for Lady in the Water, this one for me was horrid. You know, the village is already diving deep, but Lady in the Water, it just pissed me off um, that he he made this as it, it was just it was a revenge piece almost. And uh, I was already mad enough at the village as it was. So I don't know. Um, uh, Gary, what did you think when you saw it? Um, yeah, it was a strange movie. Like it didn't make a lot of sense, and it didn't mm -hmm. have a like a solid narrative, like Not uh, really. like the the his first four movies did. It was very mm -hmm. like what is kind of happening right here, and it as you said, it kind of divulged into so many different stories. But unlike uh, Tarantino. Like it wasn't successful in kind of jumping between those. So you were yeah. kind of left wondering just like, wh what is happening here? Why is this happening? Like, because I, th one of the important things for a, a film to do when it first starts is to establish the world that it's in. So, right. 
as a filmmaker, you can make your film be in any world you want, and that's perfectly fine. But once you establish those rules, you have to play by them. Um, unless you do something like really clever, like the Matrix did, um, yeah. where it's like, oh, the whole paradigm shifted on you, and that's the point of the movie. But with Lady in the Water, it was just really like a confused mess. And I, I, I love Paul Giamatti, but like it was just a like a weird way to tell a story. Um, and I don't really know what the total point of it was. Like what I as an audience member was supposed to get out of it aside from yeah. just being confused. It, it certainly did that. I, I, I in, in droves. Um, is, so Michael, I, I'm just going to just skip to Michael. I, I, don't, I can't even add anything. What did you think? I've lady of the water. No, nah. I did not see that. I had no desire to see that. Okay, yeah, good, good call, good call, guys. Uh, it's a shame, Gary. I agree with you. It pit, it pisses me off that they get an they get an actor with such immense talent like Paul Giamatti and Bryce Dallas Howard, both both yeah. very good in their own rights. Um, Thankfully, though, then, Paul Giamatti was never in another bad movie. Oh yeah. Oh, and, and, you know what? You know what? Oh, yeah, no. right. You 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 know. <laughs> uh, you know what? what ha honestly what what happens you know what pisses me off is when that movie trailer came out i specifically do remember it talking about a story or it was a a, a night a nighttime fairy tale or something told by m night Shyamalan, and it was a really good tagline essentially for the movie and i remember just kind of like the hair on the back of my neck stood up a little bit and i was like oh i was like well, that's kind of cool. I was like, okay, you know, he's going to, he might make a comeback from the village. And then you see it and it, just expectations were, I, I remember I saw it. I was really stoned the first time I saw it. So I was super confused. Um, so I, that's right. I did see it a second time and it was in theaters um, and it, it didn't help. In fact, it was better when I was high the first time, uh, at least. <laughs> that's a, it, that's at a least. great recommendation for a movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Go see it stoned or drunk as hell. You know, if you're watching Fast and the Furious, drink a shitload of car bombs. And uh, if you're going to see Lady in the Water, you know, smoke a, a couple J's. Um, so that one was the first one for M. Night Shyamalan that it, you know, budget about 70 million, only made about 73. So they essentially broke even. Um, then we dropped into 2008. Yeah. Okay? Uh, yeah, we with, sure did with the crappening. And yep. I've been calling it that G Gary and I actually went and saw this one together. Yeah. Um, it was one of the low points been... of my life. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. I can't believe you still remember. Oh, um, I remember, <laughs> I, I remember the temple as it used to be, <laughs> not the oh abomination it's become. Jesus uh, uh, I, I've done the last two, two or three synopsis. So synopsis. So I will let someone else take this one. Um, I'll take the happening because like it's okay. about a topic near and dear to my heart: the suicide of all humanity. <laughs> uh, so basically, in the happening, all the plants decide to release this pheromone or something to right. basically make all of people, all of humanity, uh, lose their uh self-preservation instincts and so mm -hmm. it gives you this beautiful scene at the start of the movie where like there's like this cop that pulls out his gun and he shoots himself in the head and then it bounces on the ground the gun and then somebody else picks it up and shoots himself and then like people keep doing that like four or five times and then running out into traffic and killing themselves and like the, and then like so it becomes people just trying to stay away from plants basically which mm -hmm. is um rather difficult what? on this uh what this this beautiful world we live in and uh yeah. so you know they start just trying <laughs> to stay away from all these other people and like they're scared of plants and they go out to this farm and like there's this person that's like i'm gonna lay down in front of this fucking mower machine and just get you know just mowed over and like uh, the the scene that sticks out most in my mind is the scene where um Marky Mark is, uh, he's inside a building and like there's this plant in the building and he's talking to the plant and it turns out the plant is, uh, um, a, uh, a plastic plant. It's, a, it's just like an office kind of right. fake plant. And like, it, I think it's the first kind of example that I remember seeing of, uh, wooden acting that you, uh, yeah. that. Uh, what was that movie that had wooden acting in it really famously with the, uh, there's about the, uh, the church sex scandals. Uh, 
uh, spotlight. Oh, spotlight. Yeah, yeah, spotlight. Sure. But like, it was just like watching all these actors. I'm like, I know they're better than this. Why are they acting like this? Like, it's not good. Like, it's ridiculous. Um, are they though? I may I remind you that the lead actors in this were Mark Wahlberg and Zoe Deschanel. Yeah. So not that they're bad actors, but they both have a very specific style of acting that they're good at. And I, I don't I don't think these are two people you want to try and overextend themselves into new genres. I don't think they're quite that diverse. Uh, right. But so, so, so it ends supposedly up being like, originally. Go ahead. Supposedly originally they wanted Amy Adams instead of Zoe Deschanel. Oh, that would have been great. Yep, she dodged a bullet on that one, I suppose. Yes, yes, she, yes she did. Yeah, she got to work on the master instead. Oh, oh. Um, <laughs> but like, talk about, let's do an episode of Paul Thomas Anderson. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ! But like, oh, man. so like the whole movie is them just trying to figure out how to adapt to this new world where the plants are trying to kill off humanity because humanity's killed so many plants, and there's no like twist to it. Um, like the plants are actually trying to do this. Um, and as far as I remember, at least, and like, it's just like, you walk away from the movie going, what did I, why did I do this, Johnny? Why did you bring me to this movie? And I, I, I don't know why we went and saw it. We were just two stupid <laughs> 20 year olds. Yep. 19, 20 hour the hell we were. Yep. Uh, yeah, I mean, this they, they tried to ride the wave of Mark Wahlberg's uh, first and only to this day Academy Award nomination for Departed. Still don't get how he was the only one in that cast nominated. But, um, you know, he had a lot of he had a lot of good just bringing this type of genre to life. I do think you you need a certain type of actor that can make wooden acting work and make it come across as authentic. And this is the way this person talks and this is how their mood is. Joaquin Phoenix is a really great example of doing that. Bruce Willis is oddly enough a very good example of that. And Amy Adams, Michael, bringing that up, she's a very good example of doing that. She's just they're 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 talented enough to be able to to do that. Zoe Deschanel is a good rom com lead and a very good comedic actress for the most part. And Mark Wahlberg is is good at action films and cursing loudly and really intense scenes because he's from Boston and they're all really good at yelling and yelling curse words at you and making you feel inferior. But this style of acting with a director like this, that was not the only problem with the movie, but you bring it up. And so I just wanted to just kind of dissect it for a second. Um, I don't, I just, yeah, just, we talk about, you know, his first couple films, it's in the realm of things that are, could possibly happen, you know, like, there's the the crop circles and signs. Those have been a thing for a long time. People being medians and seeing spirits kind of floating around. That's a thing that's been talked about for a long time. Uh, low level superhero movies. That's been talked. About. But this uh, trees like I get it. Like, you know, it's it's about it's about we're destroying our planet. And we're destroying the ozone. And I understand that. But it's just so far fetched. And then you create a world just where and just like and so everybody kills themselves. I don't even know how you'd make it better. I don't know. Um, it's, God, between- it, it's just a hard it's a hard sell for any audience, really. Paranoia movies are very I think it's very difficult to make a paranoia film like right. you've got things like Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Um, this is probably the biggest paranoia movie that I can think of where it's mm-hmm. the whole like, I don't really know what's going on. Am I going to be affected by this? What's happening? Who are you? Who's really on my side? You know, mm-hmm. just kind of keeping you on your toes the entire time. And it's, I don't know. I think it's just a very, it, it's a very hard movie to sell to audiences because you have right. to get them to buy into whatever this paranoia is being created by. And there's not that many people out there that are going to look at a tree and be like, oh, Jesus Christ, get away from me. Like, it's got to be something a little bit more than that. And I think people also had a problem of the, um, I guess not a lot of people are afraid of themselves. <laughs> so to create a paranoia movie based around the idea that you're getting a neurotoxin that's going to make you kill yourself, I'm not really scared of myself as much as I'm scared of somebody else. So when you have an external threat as opposed to an internal threat, I think that's 
Well, it, it, it doesn't make you kill yourself. It frees you. It frees you up from the fear of killing yourself. Ah, uh, so it, it releases you. Yeah, it's actually a faith-based movie, which well, I should. Like. Well, yeah, I mean, like you know, like uh, <laughs> you, you should. Yeah, well, like like you know, not to get too esoteric with it, but like Hamlet talks about it in his "to be or not to be" speech. He's like, you know, why do we stay on this horrible world when with a bare bodkin we can just end this all? And he's like, it's the fear of something after death that keeps us here like we don't want to be go to hell and in the happening they kind of, the, the the neurotoxin the trees release uh removes that uh that uh, uh fright from people and so that's why they're able to uh to free free themselves from their life as it Gary, will be. the the, expl- the explanation you just gave gary gives me more insight to what happened at the end of that movie than the fucking movie itself. Look, I've, you, had, you, like, eight, I've had eight <laughs> screwdrivers, and that's what I remember from the happening from 15 well, I years was, ago. I thought it was seven. <laughs> you remembered quite a bit. I'm very impressed. You, you really Thank remember you more much. than I did. Um, uh, geez, I mean, you know, so I, I think that ex- that explains it. From, uh, Neil, what did you think? from Did you, did you see this one? Uh, so uh, when this movie was released in June of 2008, I was fortunate enough to be stuck in boot camp and That's I didn't right. have to That's suffer right. through this. <laughs> Very good. I'm, I'm, I'm happy you didn't. Uh, I, 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 don't I will say, I will say, looking at it online, I absolutely love and hate the tagline at the same time. The tagline is, we've sensed it, we've seen the signs, now it's happening. Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's not that's okay. That's, that's terrible. Not, what do you what? That's, that's not okay. That's not bad, Gary. Have another screwdriver. Um, okay. <laughs> I love you guys so much. Uh so here we, we look at we we look at every you know, Lady in the Water, we started to see we started to see everything begin dropping. Uh Lady in the Water was his second largest budget to date. Happening dropped to forty eight million and they only they grossed about one sixty three. Probably off the off the back of Mark Wahlberg starring in it and him being such a big A lister at the time or beginning his ascension to being an A lister. Um, so obviously, this is this is one of the few films of his when I've gone back to search. I actually was not able to find one positive review of it. So granted, I didn't look at every site in the world, but out of the five or six that I checked just for fun, um, because I hate this, I fucking hate this film. Uh, I didn't find one. So at least with the village, I found some good things. Uh, I even found a few good things for the last airbender, um, which once we get. So let's let's skip ahead. Last airbender and after Earth. Uh, last airbender was just a story based off of the old uh, the old anime. Uh, and that was that was his first kids movie. Uh, I, I never saw it. I highly doubt any of us have. Right. Is that fair to say? Spoiler alert. I, I have not seen it. I did watch I the cartoon. This one. Oh, you saw yeah, it, Michael? He, you saw yeah. It, Michael? Yeah. Okay. It um what do you think? So the the problem with the problem with this one is that he was taking uh, because it's a very popular series on Nickelodeon. Um, right, I remember. Yeah. I'm trying to think of when that was really on Nickelodeon, but like kids loved the shit out of this IP and like they were really attached to this because it was a kids show but it kind of dabbled in some more like not adult themes to make it sound sexual but more like loftier ideas that they're thinking about or like higher level storytelling that's kind of starting to introduce them to it it's like when they go from kids books into like the the young adolescent section Mm -hmm. it's that idea so a lot of people have strong ties to this so he decided to to make this movie and he's going to try to shove you know oh is it like 20 or 30 episodes if not more into a single film where he's trying to tell this entire story of of the first season quote unquote that they called books mm-hmm. of this series and it all starts out and one of the first things you notice is happening is they're mispronouncing the names of the characters mm-hmm. <laughs> like i think in the nickelodeon series his name is ong or maybe mm-hmm. it's ang but they keep calling him ong in the movie and it really mm-hmm right from the get-go it disconnects the audience because they already have an idea of what this movie should be and it's just he he took it and he turned it into a completely different direction and again like gary said earlier when you have kids in your movie it's either going to be it's it's going to be a real strong hit or it's going to be a real strong miss because they the way they deliver lines and the way that they, they don't have as much experience acting as adults do and it gets very tiring watching these kids try to get through these lines but mm-hmm. 
it, it was not it was not a good movie and you could tell this was 2010 so you started seeing the i would say the early indicators of like the uh social justice warrior movement trying to mm-hmm impart certain things on films or try to get messages across. And one of the things that people were really upset about this movie was that it had a lot of Asian themes in it, but not a lot of Asian actors. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the reasons why M. Night Shyamalan tried to adjust the pronunciation of the names Mm -hmm. to make it sound more Asian than it actually was in the Nickelodeon series that was produced for an American audience. Okay. And it, it bit him in the ass because people hated the movie and then they still criticized him for what they called whitewashing in the film. So right. it's, you know, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't, but he might as well have tried to to stick as close to it as he could. Um, well, with, with, yeah, with, with the movie, it was, it, was, it, it was also interesting because uh, this was kind of, I, I think this was his highest budget movie that he's done so far. Um, yeah, because it had a third, lot, huh? third highest grossing, by the way, third highest grossing out of all of his films, which is well, really, it was a really, it was a really popular IP. But like like it, <laughs> like it had a lot of special effects in it, which, of course, it, if you're familiar with it's the last Air, airbender yeah. story, it's like uh, the the four tribes, like the earth, fire, water, uh, air and heart tribe. No, not heart. That's <laughs> that's that's Captain Planet. That's Captain Planet. Planet. Uh, but like it's the four tribes that they can each control kind of like the elements of that. So I mean, like you're right. of course going to have a lot of special effects with that. So it was really a departure from uh, his normal kind of modus operandi, the, the normal movies that he makes, because right. they're, they're normally very grounded and based in like just sort of a small like story of like one person and like or like one family in like a city or a farm and this is like a whole like a whole world reaching uh story about like uh, civilizations rising and falling and like uh geopolitical wars uh, across the world with the fire nation and so it's, it was a really big departure and um like even though it may not have like landed i i do give him credit that he continues to try and not just stay in his comfort zone to try new things they may be terrible terrible awful things but he's trying new things so you know <laughs> he gets a point for that right right yeah. i mean it really sounds sure. like it was just a cash grab that he just sounds took like a standing idea all into a movie and left his way to the bank. Yeah, I mean, it's I there were probably a lot of directors that were scrambling trying to get a hold of this movie because probably. of what Nickelodeon already had going and the amount of money that was behind it. Yeah. Why M. Night Shyamalan won out, I'm not 100% sure, but yeah, mm-hmm. I'm sure it was a lot of this was cash grab. But I, right. I do think M. Night Shyamalan probably wanted to try something new and go with something different that he, you know, hadn't yeah. done before. Well, he had just, you know, he had he, he had been, especially with the commercial success of all of his other films, uh, you know, especially with them coming out and just bombing so bad with with Lady in the Water and the Happening, he probably wanted to try to, yeah, he wanted to try something new to try to build his reputation back up, maybe. Or who knows, maybe it was just a cash grab. Uh, I But I can tell you that on most of the general consensus here is IMDb, Metacritic, Rotten Tomatoes, a lot of those sites in between five and 10% is what they gave the movie. Uh, yeah. uh, so this was by far one of his, one of his worst. Um, and not though, as bad as our next one, um, After Earth, mm. Good Times, which is a movie based off of a idea and dream Will Smith had. Uh, and so I don't really know how Shyamalan came on to do it. I just, that's about what I know about the movie. Uh, it looked horrible, so I didn't see it. Uh, anybody on the panel saw After Earth? Another film the critics panned. I did not. No. Nope. Gary? <laughs> no. Okay. Well, I I can tell you it was they. Yeah, something about crash landing on another planet, and I you know I'm uh, not even going to pretend to know what it's about. I remember I, no I remember Screw seeing it. something. It was like Earth was dying. They left and went to another planet, and then okay. they somehow crashed back on Earth. So it's just Wally. Yeah. Okay. And it was it was, yeah. it was Will yeah, Smith. Wally. It was Will Smith's son <laughs> and Will Smith that played right. father and son. So that was kind of the neat little shtick of the movie. And was that the one where he was like crawling out of the ice cave? I think I remember the preview on that, you know. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, remember. I think so. 
Yeah, it, it's fine. A- another one that was absolutely painted by the critics. Same thing. Really low scores. And this is this is him getting on with big named actors or big named IPs and trying to. I don't. Maybe he's trying to become something he's not. He does a really good job when he has just the full control by himself, and he's coming up with new stuff that a large audience may not like, and that's not mainstream and stuff that's new. It's the same stuff that we've been talking about. So at this point, and I remember reading from this, at this point, his we had written him off. We had completely written him off, and nobody was seeing his nobody was seeing his stuff anymore. Uh, you know, he was a joke. He was a laughing stock. Um, even to this day, some people, you know, would probably still think that he is. So I can tell you, with 2015's The Visit, um, oh. Gary, Gary, Gary and I saw this together. Uh, Neil, Michael, I don't know if you guys have seen this one. Yep. You did see it. Okay. Yep. Uh, Neil, how about you? I have not seen this one either. Okay. Don't don't, don't worry about it. Don't um, see it, Neil. Save yourself. <laughs> it's not as, to me. Hey, all right. It's not as bad. It's not as bad as Lady in the Water or The Happening. Oh, it is not, I would disagree it's, it's more with entertaining. that. Well, oh, it's it, more entertaining. It, it is more Get entertaining, yeah. But like it's entertaining in like a I should Time to play, kitties. <laughs> Take my shit diaper, kid. <laughs> So, okay, so what happened is no studio would hire Shyamalan. So what he did is he took out a loan from he took out a loan from it was either a bank or an investment firm, and he put his estate up as collateral. Okay, and so he takes the five million dollars, which was the budget for this film, makes the movie himself with no big budget, no big named actors, and he shows it to all. He shows it to Paramount, Universal and Warner Brothers and all these guys, and everybody turns him down. OK, so he goes back and he redid a couple scenes and then somehow he got Jason Blum on before Blumhouse really started to get big. And he got Jason Blum on as one of the executive producers. And from there, Universal, I think, was the um, company that finally grabbed hold of it. And it ended up grossing almost 100 million dollars off a five million dollar budget. So good for him. What? You know, Gary, you were talking about. <sighs> yeah. yeah. What? Yeah. Yep. Are you yep. kidding me? Gary. <laughs> You, Gary, you were talking about, and so if you think about it, though, this is out of his big budget movies. That is the lowest grossing one he's had outside of Lady in the Water, but it had a very small budget. And yep. you're talking about a guy doing these. He's you're talking about you. You appreciate his moxie almost. You appreciate that he does take on these these tasks that seem to be insurmountable that they they can't be they can't be climbed over that they can't be done successfully. And he tries. You know, and he's doing it. We've we've seen this and didn't really think that much of it. Um, you kind of see the twist coming at the beginning. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, it, like, it wasn't surprising. My God, Johnny, do you remember seeing this movie? Do you I remember do. this? I, this was a terrible Gary, night. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't like it. I gave it. I gave it like a three or a three or four I'm out of ten. I'm you. with you. I didn't think I'm it was a good film. You. I'm, I'm gonna, gonna get, get you. you. It's basically about these two kids that go to they go to spend the summer with their grandparents. Uh, they spend the summer with their grandparents and just all this weird shit happens. Like the grandmother plays hide and seek with him under a porch and she's like running like the thing out of the exorcist almost. Um, they, they find a, a like the grandfather throws a shit diaper at the grandson. Basically you find out that the grandparents were volunteers at a psych ward and two of the patients escaped and they killed the grandparents and they took the place of of the grandparents and the the grandchildren hadn't seen the grandparents in like 10 years or something so they didn't remember what they look like and they'd just been communicating with the parents through letters basically um and so not a not a huge theme it had some creepy moments in it had some funny scenes that were just so incredibly ridiculous that you were just like okay i'm gonna laugh at this because it's stupid as hell um let, but let, hey, let, let, let's talk about the scene know. where so the kid goes out to the like the shed and finds a big yeah I remember big old pile of poopy diapers and he's yep. like tells his his grandpa and his grandpa gets mad at him because his grandpa has not his grandpa but it's a crazy guy that took over his grandpa's life is like right. inconstant so like he takes this shitty diaper that he's got and just rubs it in the kid's face because the kid's a germaphobe <laughs> and like yep. like this is a scene in a in a movie that. I watched and I regret <laughs> and like, you know, it's like, what is, what is happening here? Like, it's <laughs> like, I, cause it's supposed to be a horror film, but that's something yeah. you'd see in like, you know, an Adam Sandler film or like, I don't even know what kind of movie you'd see that in. Yeah. Uh, e- e- a, a well, a well, uh, a well done movie. I did not think it was low budget low budget horror thriller 
Yeah, for a low budget, it's fine. It's not the worst one I've ever seen. Um, it was better than a lot of the other crap he'd come out with literally over the last decade. So, you know, I appreciated him at least giving it a shot. Michael, what did you think from your first encounter? I mean, I'm just laughing because I'm wondering if uh, Gary edited the Wikipedia page for it because it now says The Visit is a 2015 American found footage comedy <laughs> horror film. <laughs> no, that's, Which, that's that's what it's, that's, yeah, that's that should be on there. As it's literally a comedy horror, like it was presented by by M. Night Shyamalan is like, this is going to be a comedy horror along the same lines yes. as like Gary movie and like other parody <laughs> films. Yeah, like Shaun about. of the Dead or yeah. Right. This is the genre that he's like literally, hey, be ready, folks. This is what you're going to face. Mm -hmm. Because I remember the ads for this stuff, not going more the creepy route, being like, this ain't a comedy, folks. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden turning into let me shove the poopy diaper in the kid's face or let me like climb in the oven, sweetie, you know, stupid shit. And um, having the laptop the entire time with I think Catherine Hahn was their mom, but like the grandparents put the little tape yeah, over right. it or broke the, they, they put the like cameras cleaning like solution that. over it and like ruin the the. The camera or something. <laughs> oh no, look what I did. This is terrible. Oh, I didn't see the twist the twist coming. Whoopsie. Uh yep. I don't know. It just it it was I guess I didn't realize that it was supposed to be a comedy horror, that it was only yeah. going to be a found footage thriller type movie or like found footage mm -hmm. horror. Yeah. And so the comedy thing hit me out of left field and I was like, this is this is stupid. This does not jive <laughs> well. <laughs> no. stupid. Yeah. I, I it was, wasn't a good movie. No, I, I will say it was interesting because they had um I think it was the kid, the son, or the, the grandson that he was yeah. like uh or the granddaughter, I can't remember which one, but they were like really into making movies. And so that was kind of the shtick mm -hmm. that uh kept with them like why there was found footage because you know uh they like to make movies. It was the granddaughter because the grandson was the germaphobe. And uh like yeah, it was trying. I did not know until Michael just told me that in my Chamala had said it's supposed to be a comedy. It was a comedy. Yeah. Uh, but like it made me laugh. Yeah, it, yeah, it made me laugh too. But like how bad it was. Yeah, yeah. But like it, it, I didn't know that it was supposed to be one, and so that kind of. Like it, it didn't mesh right, you know. Like some some movies are ridiculously funny, like you know Mel Brooks, like uh, Dracula Dead and Loving It. That's clearly a comedy. Um, and then just with, but like a comedy horror that doesn't really like work well, you know. No, it doesn't. It doesn't at all. Uh, so general general around this one may not be his worst one, but it certainly was not even mediocrely average split came out in 2016 uh it basically split was a film about a serial killer that had um, uh, schizophrenia multiple personality disorder uh, i think he had 18 or 20 different personalities and uh they were all different conf they were conflicting ones played by james mcavoy uh who i've really liked in a lot of other films uh Professor between x yeah. in the x-men yeah and in, in all the Leslie like, x-men's ones um i know gary i know you weren't a fan of atonement i, I still thought it was an okay movie um that he was good in that he, he, a very a very versatile actor is that the one where uh, he writes he, the letter it's like cunt yes, or whatever yes okay. yeah he yeah it, it was with uh um oh god uh how, how do you pronounce her name the irish girl uh series ronan and uh Kara knightley was in it anyways so he kidnaps these three girls and holds them for ransom and th this entire time they're trying to escape and he's going back and forth His, some personalities want to let the kids go the other personalities want to keep them there and they all agree they don't want the beast to come out the beast is one of his personalities that is this larger th it's exactly what it sounds like it's a larger than life evil being that has insidious intentions and just wants to kill everything in its past and path and see destruction. So really it's um, a, it's a movie about fatherhood really when you get right down to it. Okay. All right, Gary, let's, uh, let's take all your, your family values out of, out of this conversation. Okay. Yeah. I, I thought that McAvoy did. A, I, I see why he took the role because it was really like, it's great. Yeah. yeah as, as an actor, that's a really interesting role to pick because you're playing so many di different parts um, from one person. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's 
it, it's it really stretches you to like do your best. And I think he really put a lot into that. Um, so I, yeah. I I think that um, it he was able to capture what needed to be captured. And I think that uh, Split is sort of the hopefully the next the start of the next chapter of M. Night Shyamalan's journey Me too. where he yeah. starts making better movies because uh, The Visit, right. I think, not a great movie. Um, he, he tried, but and so he took the pro, he took the pros, excuse me, he took all the profits from Visit and he put them for the nine million dollar budget for Split. All that came from what he what he personally earned from from the Visit, and he put that towards making Split. Ended up making almost grossing three hundred million dollars. Um, so good for him for investing all of his money in himself. He said in an interview, he was like, I basically was in Vegas. I'm not a gambling man, but I got to gamble myself. He was like, I've, I'm already in this far. I got to keep going. You know, he's like, I got to rebuild my brand. I got to, I, I got to retailer my name to where it was, you know, over a decade ago. Um, so I don't know. I, I personally, I thought split was kind of the same level of signs. I thought it was about a seven or so. I thought it was a, I think it was smart that he chose a really talented, diverse actor like James McAvoy. And I'd say what probably 65% of the movie was James McAvoy doing scenes. Yeah. And it was primarily him. It was like, you know what they did with the, uh, almost like Heath Ledger for dark Knight, the strongest part of that movie was his portrayal of the character and they the golden scenes were with him in it mm -hmm. and i think that Shyamalan was smart with how he approached this portion yeah. i don't know what you thought yeah I, I think it was also interesting that um the way he because you you here's a twist that you didn't see coming from m night Shyamalan mm -hmm. for the first time in a very long time at the end of the movie bruce willis shows up and it's the unbreakable <laughs> yep, character. Yep, yep. And that's, that was cool. Yeah. From like 16 years prior or whenever, yep. like the, whatever the difference is in the two movies, but like, yeah. so it, it, it tied those, those two movies together saying, Oh, this is in the same, uh, Shyamalan universe. universe. Yeah. And which led into leads into his next movie. Um, but like it, it was really interesting how he did that. Cause that was, totally unexpected and out of left field. So I, I give him props for, you know, doing that. And for, you know, as you said, Johnny, like gambling everything he had on himself, which, uh, yeah. you know, I, I think, uh, um, you know, has paid off in his last two movies. Exactly. And it finally comes back to what we were talking about. He thrives when he has the full creative control and he doesn't have anybody whispering in his ear like the big production, like not the big, um, uh, excuse me, the big studios. You know, he's he's just able to be left on his own devices. He uses his own money. So nobody his investors, they can't come in as producers and control his vision. And he just comes in and does it himself. He's not always going to hit it out, of hit it out of the park, as we saw with the visit, you know, uh, but I think Split was a good start. You know, um, it was cool. I, I saw I saw Glass and it wasn't quite as good as Split. Um, I was kind of hoping for a little bit more. Basically, the uh, Mr. Glass, who is Samuel L. Jackson, and then James McAvoy and Bruce Willis's character are all in this government research facility and they're being experimented on by the U.S. government. Um, and basically... Samuel L. Jackson comes in and he's like, well, you know, we need to get out of here at some point. And so he goes to James McAvoy. And he's like, we need to team up. I'll get you out of here. You take out these government workers and Bruce Willis and so forth. Um, it's been a while since I've seen it. I think I saw it when it first came out in theaters about two or three years ago. Um, but it, it was it was good. I mean, it was uh, I would still like to see a few more in this universe. I think it would be cool to maybe try to pull another one of his old movies into this. That might be kind of interesting um, and and see where it goes. Uh, did any of you, did anybody see Glass? I have not. Anybody seen. else? I have not. Oh. OK, uh, yeah, it was it was fine. I mean, it was, a you know, it was the same thing. He took the proceeds from the visit or excuse me, the profits from the visit and split. And he used that for the 20 million dollar budget on Glass and it made 250 million, essentially. So, I mean, hey, you know, the guy. He's making a comeback. I think he's done a good job of rebranding himself to kudos to him. Um, guys, unfortunately, we've been running over two hours here. And so we are basically out of time and it is very late here for all of us. So we're going to let you guys go really quick instead of saying our favorite Shyamalan movie, because I think we can all probably agree that, you know, Sixth Sense Unbreakable are the only two that Lady are in the that water. area. 
Shut up, Greg. What is our least favorite Shyamalan movie? Really quick. Um, uh, Neil, start us off. That I saw would be The Village. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Michael. Yeah, Village. Okay. Gary. The Crappening. Okay. Uh, for me, it's, it, I would I had to say The Crappening normally, but I was so mad at Lady in the Water that I will say Lady in the Water by a hair over The Crappening. Uh, <laughs> okay. So uh, uh, don't watch uh, Lady in the Water. Yeah. <laughs> For this week, our recommendations are going to be movies to not see. Those are the Shyamalan movies to not see. Uh, and guys, we are unfortunately all out of time for this week. Uh, Michael, thanks again so much for joining us. Always a pleasure to have you. Thank you. And, and uh, yeah, from all of us here at I Don't Give a Flick, I'm Johnny. I'm Gary. I'm Sober Neil. And we'll see you next time. Stay classy. Thank you for tuning in to Lead Feather Productions podcast of I Don't Give a Flick. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast so that you never miss an episode. Podcasts are available on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and everywhere podcasts are hosted. I Don't Give a Flick is hosted and produced by Johnny Blackburn, Gary Elmore, and Neil Riley. Executive producer, Johnny Blackburn. Technical director, editor, and audio mixer, Gary Elmore. I Don't Give a Flick is a Lead Feather production. Copyright Lead Feather Productions 2021.